Wow, you guys are crazy. You're out here learning about bugs on a, one of the few nice summer nights in Bismarck, North Dakota. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, systems level changes. What I'd like to talk about for just a few minutes, hopefully just a few minutes, I, yeah, keep me honest here, I'm shooting for 15 minutes, all right? Uh, but what I want to talk about here is where insects fit into systems level changes in food production. For those of you who were listening last night, I gave a talk at, uh, at, at uh, local college there and um, kind of mentioned some of these ideas, but I'll talk about them again because I always like to hear things in multiple times, uh, uh, multiple, multiple times, right? There she is, right? That's a beautiful thing when you see the planet from outer space, how lucky we are and what a unique situation planet Earth really is. I mean, we're just the right distance from the sun to support life. You know, the, the uh, not too hot, not too cold, made of the right minerals in order to keep her hot just at the right temp so that we can survive here. But we're facing a lot of issues right now. We're facing changing climates. We're facing diminishing human health, many human health problems, things like chronic diseases that just hadn't been there before. We're facing things like food intolerances and allergies and stuff that just seem to keep on popping up, right? Pollution in the environment, changes in land use, civil unrest. A lot of these issues and that we end up seeing on a planetary scale problem are inherently related to this. Right now, between 30 and 40 percent of the terrestrial land surface of our planet is food production systems, okay? And as we went down this road, back in the 40s or so, we went down a road where it became very simplified, right? Became very industrialized. We suddenly, we had new technologies that allowed us to control, control our food production systems. And so we used them, right? We used them. We packaged them up, we sold them, we used them as much as we could. We were in control of the natural world. And the result is that where once hundreds of species used to live, now only a few species live, right? Our food. It does not mean that I hate agriculture. That does not mean that, that doesn't mean that I'm against farmers. What it means is that we have an opportunity, right? I view, 30 to 40% of our planet is food production systems. We can use those food production systems to solve planetary scale problems. That's the way that I look at this situation, okay? But what has to stop is the way that we're doing things right now in order to use our food production systems appropriately. Number one is that our current agricultural system is problem focused. Oh my gosh, we've got a problem here. I can't get into that field early enough. I better turn it black as quick as I can so that I can get out there before the neighbors. I'm bored. It's been a hell of a winter. So I better turn it black. Oh no. Well, I just, I just killed all the biology in my soil and I planted a thousand acres of a single species that we have genetically predisposed to be, because we bred out everything but large seeds, we bred out most of its ability to defend itself, and I just planted that out there, and I've got no biotic resistance to pests. Now I've got a pest problem. Oh no, another problem. I better go out and buy, I better go out and buy a jug, right? And I better spray it out there, and I better kill that pest. Oh geez, now that I killed that pest, I've got this other pest over here. I better buy another jug, and oh, now the plants aren't growing fast enough. I better buy another jug. It's reactive. I've got a problem, I better solve it, right? But all of those are not the problem. Those are the symptoms. 
The problem is that the problem is that we've simplified our food production system so so much that they don't work anymore. Pest management is like that. We've got a pest problem because we created it. If you have a pest problem in your fields, it's not the pest's fault. It's your fault. You created a perfect environment for the pest to proliferate. And then you know what? You had to buy a jug because you've got a broken system. And you've got to spray it out there. And then you've got to kill all those, all those insects that are so awful, right? But at the same time, you kill all the natural enemies of the pests that keep those pests at low densities. And so you've got to buy another jug because now you've got an even more simplified system, right? That's an addiction. Farmers are addicted. By their very definition, the more you use, the more you have to use. And who wins in an addiction scenario? Is it the addict? Nope. In lean years, when crop prices are low, does ADM and Cargill and Monsanto show declines in profits? How about farmers? Who's winning? It's not the farmers in that situation. Currently producing 30% of all crop acres is devoted to corn. Corn prices were grown, national average corn was grown at a $27 an acre loss last year. Is that a good business decision? 5% of the terrestrial land surface of our country is corn. One plant species. All of it's genetically modified to produce pesticides. All of it is treated with neonicotinoid seed treatments completely unnecessarily. All of it's maintained with chemical fertilizers. All of it's sprayed with herbicides, especially glyphosate and atrazine. Must be a good business decision, right? All that corn. In 2016, it was the lowest price in corn in more than a decade. And you know what? We planted more corn than ever. It was the second highest acres devoted to that crop ever planted. This isn't a good business. <laughs> this is not a good business decision, folks. I'm not anti-corn, all right? It's part of the system. But that's dumb, all right? That's dumb. Grow something else. Or grow it different. These are not midgets. They're short. <laughs> that corn is 14 feet tall. Look at the soil, solid as a rock. That's corn grown on chemotherapy is what that is, down in Nebraska. <laughs> we need to change. We need to think outside of the box, and that's where Minokin Farm becomes so important. Burley County becomes so important because this place has been so influential in leading a national level change. I don't know whether you guys know it or not, but people go on like these Mecca voyages to Burley County from all over the country. They stop at Blue Dasher now for potty breaks, but they're headed here because what you have is so special and unique. Much of our science within the current infrastructure, be that USDA, be that university systems, much of our science is hell-bent on maintaining the system. Make it work. Make it work. We've got to tweak it in order to get this thing to work, rather than to reinventing the system, which needs to happen. OK, that reinvention. Crisis breeds innovation, and crisis has not been allowed to happen. That's a painful thing to think about. But crisis is coming, whether you want it or not. 
we need to be rethinking what this paradigm is, all right, in food production. But what's so exciting is that farmers are leading the way on this right now. Farmers are the ones who are changing. These guys are, are just, a sm just a small portion of the farmers and ranchers across the country, around the world, that are completely innovating the way that we're producing crops and, and our food right now. All of these guys abandoned all of the insecticides from their farms years ago, sometimes decades ago. They don't need them. By focusing on soil health and conserving biodiversity within their farms, they're finding that they don't need to spend the money on the inputs all the time. What they're doing is what I'm calling regenerative agriculture. In a nutshell, this is how I define it. Some people would say other things, but this is what I think it is. They're conserving soil health and biodiversity while producing a nutrient-dense food profitably. Profitably, okay? And they're using some central principles. Again, other people may say different things, but I think inherent, they're using different practices on their farm that are, or that are adapted to local conditions, but what they're doing, they're all unified in certain principles and concepts that they are able to implement on their farm. Number one is that they eliminate tillage. That's first step in this process. They're always leaving a living root in the soil. Fallow is a myth. Fallow is a myth, all right? More, some plant diversity is better than none, and more plant diversity is better than less. And we'll talk tonight, I'm hoping, about how to diversify these systems. And they're integrating livestock and crops together. Not just cows, bees, and rabbits, and poultry, and all kinds of different livestock. That's a healthy herd, OK? This is Claire, she was a master's student. She's now working at, uh, for the University of Minnesota in their extension service. She went out to 10 pairs of farms. We went to some of the leaders in regenerative agriculture and Minokin Farm was one of them. Gabe Brown's place was another, if you know Gabe. And we asked these farmers to show us the, the corn phase of their rotation, okay? All of these guys, these regenerative farms, this was done in uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota. Okay, good, the, I should be able to pull that off. North Dakota and Minnesota, four different states. We looked at regenerative farms and then uh, all of these guys had abandoned insecticides, did not use insecticides on their farms, and all of them also used cover crops on their farms. These guys, and then we, we went out and we looked at the entire bio inventory of the insect community on their farms, including pests and natural enemies, all the friendlies, all the pests, all the problems, right? And then we looked at profits and we looked at yields on each of these farms. And then we asked the farmers, these regenerative farmers, point us to one of your neighbors who's doing things right, okay? You know, a good corn farmer. Uh, by the conventional standards. And all of these guys were using neonicotinoid seed treatments, all of them were using BT corn, um, and many of them, some were no-till, some were not. It all depended, right? And this is what we found. Remember that, all of the conventional were insecticide treated. Full bio inventories, we sucked up all the insects from the soil surface, we cut plants down and dissected them out, each plant. And then we looked at yields and profits. The insecticide treated cornfields had tenfold higher pest populations than the regenerative fields. That's like man bites dog, right? That doesn't, that's not supposed to work. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I'm, I'm spending a lot of money on insecticides. They're supposed to be killing my insect pests. No, it's not. It's exacerbating your insect pests. 
yields. We had a little bit lower yields in the regenerative farms. They were statistically fairly similar, but there was a, about a 20% yield day on those regenerative farms. The profit was more than twice as high on the regenerative farms in the corn phase. This is not an ideological decision that people are making like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this because I hate GM corn, right? No, they're doing this because you'd be a fool not to, right? Twice the profit? Plus, you're restoring biodiversity on your farm. That just makes sense. You know what the profit was directly correlated with? Each dot is a corn farm. The particulate organic matter of the soil. As the corn farm increased the organic matter, the profit of the corn farm went up. How do you get rid of how do you get rid of particulate organic matter in soil, Jay? Till it? That pretty does that work? To get rid of it? Yeah. Good. Okay. Till it. Good. Systems level change. These aren't guys that just abandon insecticides, right? They didn't just say, okay, well, I'm going to stop doing that. What they did is they changed their system so that they didn't need the insecticides anymore. What did they do? No-till, cover crops, diversifying their crop rotation, including more livestock in their system. That's what they did, and they didn't need insecticides. You want to know what the difference of the profit was? The regenerative guys reduced their seed costs by almost $200 a bag and they, they reduced their fertilizer costs. That's where the profit differences were. Those are inputs, those are jugs. There's Blue Dasher, that's where we're trying to do some of these ideas and put those into place for you. There's our star right there is where we are located. Um, uh, yeah, so we turned a farm and we built a research facility specifically on regenerative agriculture focused on helping the, these farmers who are innovating our food production system and uh, making that, uh, uh, trying to remove as many hurdles from them as we possibly can. We want this to be the first of a national network of centers for excellence in this regenerative farming practices. When we started this one year ago, we reached out to the farmers and the beekeepers and the ranchers around the world and we said, if you believe that this is a viable future, then consider supporting it. And our startup costs were 100% crowdfunded from an Indiegogo campaign. That's never happened before. If you question the validity of this, that there's a movement going on right now in this country, guess again. I think we're living proof that there's some really special things happening to our food production system right now. I'm not going to go into that because I'm getting the shepherd's hook. Hundreds of donors made this possible. An amazing young team of enthusiastic scientists. Cedric is over here from France um, studying with us this summer. Lots of support from all over the world um, in order to get this done. And if you would like to know more, uh, number one, we have a sign-up sheet that landed somewhere for our email list. And then we're also doing a little fundraiser with t-shirts. If you want a Blue Dasher t-shirt, they're very attractive. Um, they're 25 bucks. And uh, sign up for us. There's websites. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Bleh. <laughs> Done. <laughs>